quite what you think about as Christmas, I don't think, but uh, we'll see what we can learn from it. Psalm 102, I'm not going to read the whole psalm, it's 28 verses long, but we'll work our way through it. And uh, it's a great psalm to think about, in reference to our thoughts getting ready for a celebratory season. So let's have a word of prayer as we open the Word of God and see what God can share with us today. Father, we thank you again for all the blessings that we have and all the privileges of being here. We thank you for the Word of God and what it means to us. Guide us out of this passage to understand the important truth of focusing upon who you are and your love and how you are there with us every step of the way. And now that changes our perspective and outlook on life no matter what we face. Just let your spirit work in our hearts, pray in your name, amen. In a few weeks, a couple of weeks, we're going to have the choir singing a song that was actually written for Andy Williams. Remember Andy Williams? Um, he is known as Mr. Christmas because he had Christmas specials. And of course, I thought he was one of the best voices uh, of his era anyway. And uh, he would sing all the songs, including hymns and everything else. And uh, um, for his second Christmas song, um, Edward Pola and George Weil combined together to write the song that uh, kind of is the title of the Christmas musical. It's the most wonderful time of the year. And some of the words go like this. It's the most wonderful time of the year with the kids jingle belling and everyone telling you, be of good cheer. It's the most wonderful time of the year. It's the hap- happiest season of all with those holiday greetings and gay happy meetings when friends come to call, it's the hap- happiest season of all. Then you talk about mistletoe. I, I, I thought, some of those words are not really words, I don't think, you know. <laughs> Is there a verb called mistletoeing? I don't, you know, I, or hap- happiest season. But, you know, you're making music, you can do what you want to do. Um, but, you know, he's saying that in 1963. And that was the debut of that song. And indeed, it is all which uh, we think it is. It is the most wonderful season. As we were practicing and singing some of those songs, I thought, well, what does it make Christmas so special? Because it is a different kind of a year. People just seem to behave differently for some reason. They tend to be um, more happy in some ways, more relaxed in some situations. And so we're going to talk about some of those things over the next couple of weeks, uh, like the decorations that we have here that make Christmas different, the gatherings of family that make special Christmas special, along with the, the giving and uh, the anticipation, which is a large part, particularly for children, of Christmas coming. But today I want to talk about, um, just to get in the mindset of uh, how we can face uh, this season, even though things sometimes are not the greatest in our culture and maybe in our personal life, um, and find out exactly why it is a great season. And in Psalm 102, we don't know when it's written, but it becomes obviously it is a prayer that deals with affliction. Now, right before verse 1, you may not realize it or not, it says there, a prayer of the affliction when he is overwhelmed and pour without his complaint before the Lord. In the Hebrew Bible, that really is verse 1. I um, mean, you know, those, those are there, and you may think, oh, someone just put them there because they wanted to explain it to you. No, 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 those are called titles, and they're actually put into the Scripture. Uh, when it has little things about a Psalm of David, or it has little other words that talk about musical notations, that actually is verse 1, which when you're studying Hebrew, using it, you get confused, and you switch the English Bible back to Hebrew Bible because the verses are not the same, they're different. But it's actually part of the Bible, so actually verse 1 tells us the theme of it. It's the prayer of the afflicted when he is overwhelmed. And we read this, and we see that, you know, part of the thing about Christmas, um, you have... Hallmark Christmas movies, right? A lot of you watch that. When my wife and I went to her last doctor's appointment, um, she gave the, uh, the one that dealt with us most of the time a little Christmas ornament that she makes every year. And she goes, oh, thank you. It's my first Christmas present. I said, well, it's getting close to it. And I said, they're even showing Hallmark movies already. This is back in October. And she goes, yes, I know. She said, that's one of my secret um, pleasures, to watch the movies. I say, yeah, it's hers too. I just got to go along with the ride. Um, but there are some I like. Um, but one of the things about Christmas Home movies is that there's always a happy ending. You know, about the last half hour, there's a little twist, and then it comes back and makes it happy. Um, the things I don't like about it is that 
you know, you two people come together and sometimes they didn't like each other, so they met together, in two weeks they fall madly in love, and we don't know what happens afterwards. We never see them interacting in real life situations, you know. We don't see what happens afterward. We assume they live happily ever after, but we understand in real life that doesn't always work that way. But Christmas and being with God and having God in life, I don't want to talk about a happy ending, but it's, it's a life of blessing. And that's kind of what I want to talk about, the concept that blessedness is the key. And we're blessed in many different ways, not just because of uh, what we have here, but because of what we have in Jesus Christ. But you begin this psalm, it doesn't sound like much of a blessing. Because the individual is going through a really, really difficult time. In fact, in verse 2, he seems to indicate that God is far from him. Hide not thy face from me in the day when I'm in trouble. Incline thy ear into me in the day when I would call Answer me speedily, down to verse 10. Because of thy indignation, thy wrath, for thou hast lifted me up and cast me down. So he's just simply sharing what he feels in his heart. And part of that is the fact that I don't think God's paying attention to me. I don't think God's listening to me. In fact, what I'm going through now, I, I almost see it as part of God's working and wrath. I don't necessarily think this way it is, but that's just the way he's feeling right now. He feels abandoned. He feels left out. He feels forgotten by God. So he cries out to God. He tells us why in verse 8, Mine enemies reproach me all the day, and they that are mad against me are sworn against me. So this individual is facing literally a situation where his enemies are perhaps on the hunt for him and wanted to kill him. That's why some think it could be reference to David, who was always on the run many times for his enemies. Uh, but he's facing real situations where any day perhaps could be his last, and he's just struggling in many different ways. And, and he uses a lot of wonderful analogies to help us understand what he's going through. And they're very picturesque. Verse 3, my, my days are consumed like smoke, my bones are burned as an earth. I thought that's kind of like when you're out to, at a bonfire, maybe you're cooking something and all the smoke comes back into your face. You can't breathe, your eyes are watering, you know, it's dark and dim, you're choking, you're coughing. He says, that's how my life is every moment of the day. I just feel like I'm overwhelmed, I'm confused, I don't know what to do, I'm, I'm, I can't breathe, I'm, my, my bones are burning, I'm just uh, aching constantly, consistently. My heart is smitten, which means my heart is beaten, which kind of like means his heart's pounding, he just feels like things are just going crazy inside, he's all disturbed, upset, he's withered like grass, he has no energy. He's so upset and so disturbed, he says, I even forget to eat my bread, meaning I, I, I'm not even doing what I have to do to keep alive. I'm so overwhelmed by what's going on in my life, I, I don't even take time to eat anymore. I don't even think about eating. It's just, I'm just consumed with what's going on in my life. By reason of my voice, my groaning, my bones cleave to my skin, meaning, again, I am just have no energy. Then he gives a couple of interesting pictures. I'm like a pelican of the wilderness. Okay, you don't see pelicans in wildernesses. Pelicans are water birds. You see them on docks, you see them everywhere. You don't see them in the desert. You see vultures in the desert, not pelicans. A pelican in the desert is not going to survive. They're not home. They're not where they're supposed to be. They can't catch fish. So basically he's saying, I'm just alone. I'm stranded. I'm in the wrong place. I'm not where I'm supposed to be. It's not a very good situation. I'm like an owl in the desert. Again, uh, a picture of an owl all by themselves, lonely, no one there, stranded outside. He says, I watch him as a sparrow alone in a housetop. If you know anything about sparrows, generally they fly in groups. They're always together. Um, so a sparrow all by himself in the house that indicates something's happened somewhere. Not, something's not right. And he says, I'm alone. I, I feel alone. And I just feel overwhelmed. He says in verse 9, I've eaten where ashes like bread and mingled my drink with mourning, weeping, which means I'm in mourning constantly. Sorrow, depression dominates my life. Verse 11, my days are like a shadow that declineth, and I'm withered like grass. He says, I am just basically overwhelmed with life, and it's rough today, and I don't think the future is much better. It's a clear picture of, of hopelessness, almost, and the sense of loneliness and sadness and well, where he is overwhelmed by his situation, so that title makes full sense. He is overwhelmed, and that's where he's facing. Now, you and I, if we're honest, can say, you know something? I could use those verses to describe my life at times. We may not say that openly, but if we're honest, we know we feel that way sometimes. Now, we don't have next to literal enemies coming at us to kill us, um, but there are times we feel abandoned by God. There are times we feel that God has forgotten about us. There are times we feel that 
we're under his hand for some reason. We don't know what we've done. There are times we feel overwhelmed with what we're facing in life. It may be due to illnesses. It may be due to relationship issues. It may be due to financial problems. It may just be due to what we're facing in life every single day. I mean, I thought went through some things that we have gone through the last couple of years and how it's impacted Americans. Because of COVID-19, I saw 53% of American, adult Americans said their mental health had been negatively affected. 53%, that's a lot of people in a negative way. They said people who sheltered in place in some states had higher levels of stress than those who did not shelter in place. 31% of Americans experienced anxiety disorder at some point in their lifetime. That's a pretty significant list. And then gas prices were up $1.25 per gallon than were a year ago. And I don't care where you are or who you are, that hurts big time. When you go fill up your tank and the numbers keep going higher and higher and higher. And it's, it's, you know, and that, that's, and of course, how does the administration respond? Um, we're going to ban drilling on federal land. We're going to raise regulations. We're going to raise costs and prices. Um, we're going to release 50 gallons from the gas store. They will last us, what, two days, and that's it, and go right back again. And it doesn't look like it's going to go down anytime soon, and it may get even worse as it goes on. Inflation's on the rise. Back in January 2021, it was 1.4%. In October, inflation is 6.2%. That means everything's going up. And so what does the administration do? We're going to spend more money, which actually causes the inflation. And just keep spending money. It will work out itself. Well, not for us who are surviving week to week, month to month, and paycheck to paycheck. Uh, for most Americans, it becomes very depressing and discouraging. Just this past week, the city council of New York City are going to decide if 808,000 non-citizens may vote in future New York City elections. I've never heard of a non-citizen. You're either a citizen or you're not a citizen. I mean, it's, you're the citizen, you're a foreign nation. They're actually going to, actually considering to let people who are not citizens of this land vote in our election. And if they do it, you better believe other cities are going to do the same thing. Sometimes you make sure you wonder and think and go, what's going on? And then just when things seem to be doing well in reference to uh, the COVID, now they say there's a new variant coming out and... Uh, they call it the Omicron, which is a Greek letter. Um, if they're, if they're at that point in time, there must have been a lot of variants before this. I don't know if they use from alpha all the way down, because that's pretty well down in the middle of the alphabet. And I don't know if you've heard or not, the governor of New York already declared a state of emergency. This variant's not even in America yet, but she's already declared a state of emergency where she's limiting hospitals to do surgeries and everything else, even though it hasn't gotten here yet. And again, they're just starting to freak out over this completely and totally. And when you keep hearing about it over and over again, then it begins to affect you. And so you're sitting there thinking, here we go all over again. And we're blessed to be in this state here, which has the lowest rates of COVID in the nation at this point in time. So we're thankful for that. But you just keep hearing this over and over again. It just slowly but surely gets you depressed and tired and weary, and along with other things else that we face. So we can face this time of the year, and we can really honestly wonder, man, is it going to get any better or not? <clears throat> you know, is it going to improve? Is it going to get worse? And we can say like this psalmist here, this guy, you know, I don't know if we can survive. <clears throat> I don't know if we can handle what we're facing in life. I don't know if we can take this. I feel overwhelmed, and I don't know what to do. The good news is there's one word that's a very important word. We, we usually hear, you know, like when you're, <clears throat> maybe years ago when you were dating and the girl didn't like you, she would come and say, you're a nice guy. You're good, you're smart, but you know what's coming next, you know. Well, it's good when it's a positive thing. He goes, all of this stuff, my days, are shadow, everything else, verse 12, but, but. And then the change begins to take place in the psalm. It begins to change his perspective. He says, I know things look really bad, however, there's blessing to think about. And at the end of the passage here in verse 28, he says this, The children of thy servants shall continue, their seed shall be established before thee. Now, thee means God. God's children are those who follow him. The servants are those who follow him. He says, they're going to continue, they and their generation beyond them. They're going to remain, they're going to settle down. And the idea is they're going to have security and safety. Their seed shall be established before you. Established means be fixed and firm and settled. He says there's good news for those who know God and follow God because despite what goes on in life around us, 
we are, can be safe and secure in the arms and hands of God. That's what he's talking about. That right now we can be safe in God and the future can even be greater because he will never leave us nor forsake us. And, and if you don't understand, that's what he's saying there. But I mean, look at all the other scriptures. I, I read some of them here. Psalm 55, 22. Cast thy burden upon the Lord and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Psalm 112, 6 and 7. Surely he, the righteous, will not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. Psalm 121, 2 and 3. My help cometh from the Lord, from whence made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee shall neither slumber nor sleep. Psalm 125, 1. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. So the emphasis throughout Scripture is that those who follow God and know God are fixed. We're, we're steadfast. That even everything else is shaking and quaking, we cannot be moved. Because we're anchored in a rock that cannot be moved. Or we're anchored in God and He cannot be moved. And therefore, even though we face a lot of tough times in life, because we have Him in our life, we are still blessed and have joy and peace and hope even in the worst of times. Yeah. F.B. Meyer, again, a great preacher, told a story he often would use about two individuals who wanted to climb the Matterhorn. And so they hired some guides to climb up the mountain. One of the things I will never do, I don't know why anybody wants to climb a mountain, but that's what they wanted to do. They had three guides, and they began their ascent in some of the steepest part. They roped themselves together, guide, traveler, guide, traveler, and guide. And they began to go up their cliff sides with ice and everything else, and the last guy began to slip and began to fall. Well, the other three, you know, will hold them up because uh, the other ones ahead of them, they, were, they had their toes hooked on, but then they began to slip. And soon three of them were, were slipping, but the guy on top was able to stay firm because he nailed his pivot really deep into the ice and he was, kept his footing and everything fine because he kept his footing. Then all the other ones could get back and they were able to continue onward. And after the story, F.B. Meyer said this, I am like one of those men who slipped, but thank God I am bound in a living partnership to Christ and because he stands, I shall never perish. Well, that's the hope, you see. That's the happy ending we can think about. That even though we face a lot of really difficult times, God is with us every step of the way. And that's the reason why he says, verse 28, you know, hey, we're going to continue. We're going to say, why? Uh, because he switches his focus. In the middle of the psalm, he fitches from, from all the things he's facing in life, all those problems and all those difficulties undergoing, all the things he describes. Then he goes, but, he says, Thou, O Lord, verse 12, shall endure forever thy remembrance unto all generations. You see, he changes his vision. Instead of looking at the problems, he begins to look to God. The word Lord is all caps. It's Jehovah. It's the God who always is, always was be. He's the God that never changes. The God is ever faithful. He says, I'm going to turn my focus upon him because he doesn't change. His power is the same. His presence is the same. His promises are the same. Nothing changes. That's why what I'm facing, he doesn't change. And that begins to be his focus. Later on in verse 25, he says, Of old thou hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, as a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall never end. He says, You're a powerful God. You created the universe. But you know something? We can see the universe is decaying even now. But God will never decay. God's power never ends. God's presence never changes. In fact, when it says, thou art the same, literally means this, but thou art he. You are you. In other words, you're never going to be any different. God is who he says he is. God will do what he said he has done. He is always going to be there every step of the way. Because of that, we who follow him can understand and realize that we're going to experience a life of blessing, even though things are kind of complicated. He mentions some of them here. Uh, in verse 17, he says, the Lord will regard the prayer of the destitute and not despise their prayer. Verse 19, he looked down from the height of the sanctuary from heaven and did the Lord behold the earth to hear the groaning of the prisoner to loose those that appointed to death. He says, listen, because we have God in our life and we know God, have a relation with God, he will hear our prayers. He'll listen to us. Which is an astounding thing if you think about it. Again, I'm always kind of blown away by the reality that God, the creator of this universe, when I come to him and say, I need to talk to you, he turns and he goes, what do you need, buddy? I mean, he bends down from his heavenly perch 
he looked down and he says, what's going on in your life? Talk to me. Just like you go to somebody and sit down at a chair and say, I need to talk to you. And they turn and turn full their attention, everything on, eye to eye, tell me what's going on and listen to you carefully. That's what God does for us. Anytime, any moment of the day we need to talk to him, he's going to listen to us. He always promises he will listen to us as long as we're close to him and walk with him like we should be. That's a blessing. Even though we may feel like we're all alone, we're not alone because we can go to our God and pray and he's right there waiting for us to listen to us. Knowing that we can experience his, his love, his kindness. He says uh, down in verse 13, thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion. Think of Zion as the people of God, a reference to Jerusalem. The time to favor her, yea, the set time to come, for thy servants shall take pleasure in her stones and favor the dust thereof. Meaning he says, okay, because we have God in life, we have mercy. That mercy speaks of compassion. That means God understands what we're going through, no matter what we're going through. He understands what we feel, what we feel. He understands what we feel overwhelmed, but he's going to be there to try to meet their needs and take care of us. He's not going to turn his back upon us and tell us to, to get with it and get going. He's going to sit down there and just comfort our hearts, give us grace and strength. The word favor speaks of grace, which is not simply saving grace, but I think the strengthening grace that he gives to us to face those moments in life that are so complicated with hope and with joy and with peace because we know that God is with us every step of the way. We have his promises, we have his principles, and we understand what he's doing, and it changes our life. But not only that, he even looks further into the future. He talks about in verse 16, when the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. And later on, he talks about how he would declare his name in the Lord in verse 21, and his praise in Jerusalem, when the people are gathered together and the kingdoms to serve the Lord. He says, there's going to come a time when the Lord himself will return to earth and he shall reign on the throne of David. And when that time comes, he says in verse 15, the heathen shall fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth shall glory thy glory. He says, you know, I'm facing these moments and I know it's tough, but I'm thankful that as I turn my focus upon God, I begin to realize things are okay. I begin to realize that he is there. I begin to realize he is going to take care of me. I begin to realize that he's going to have compassion on me. I'm going to realize he's going to listen to me, pay attention to me. I'm going to realize he's there with me, not just to be with me, but to give me the grace and the strength to go through what I'm going through in a way that brings him honor and glory. And there's going to come a day in the future when he shall reign forever and ever. And when he does, I will reign with him. He's, he's already won the battle. He's already won the war. I'm on his side. I'm on the winning side, so I can't ever lose. The worst thing that can happen to me is what? That I take my last breath here, and then what that happens? I go home. Almost where we always want to be. And all that happens after that is to come with Jesus back to this earth and reign with him now and forever and ever. Everything that he has is ours if we belong to Jesus Christ. So the future is actually brighter than the present, and the present is bright as it can be. And that's what he's focused upon. He said, wow, God is with me. God's going to be there. He's going to take care of me every step of the way. And those blessings are wonderful, but, but we have to still take action on them. I mean, I've I find it interesting as I was reading through the psalm. And, you know, verse 11 is fine. But then, then I, I read through all these things. And in verse 23, 24, he goes, He weakened my strength in the way. He shorteneth my days. I said, Oh, my God, take me not away in the midst of the days. My years are stronger throughout, gener or throughout all generations. I sat there and thought, okay, those verses seem to be better in verses 1 and 11. He's talking about all the problems, you know. I kind of like, he's going all this stuff about God and his blessing. Then he stops and goes, wait a minute. God weakened my strength. I'm thinking, what is he doing? What he's saying is that, okay, I, I, I acknowledge where I am, but this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to cry out unto God for grace and for strength. You see, God is there waiting for us, and, and God wants to pour out his blessing in our life, and God wants to take care of us and give us encouragement and comfort every step of the way in how we go. But you and I have to call out to him. You and I have to trust in him. You and I have to take the step of going to him and sharing our life with him and spending life with him and pouring out our soul to him and taking all that we have in life, all the problems, all the difficulties, all of our feelings, everything, and commit it unto him and let him take care of it so we can step out and serve and follow him. It's not going to happen automatically. We have to decide to trust our God. We have to decide that what I'm facing is difficult, but praise God, I have a God whose power is greater than my problems. He can handle them. He can take care of them. He's given me promises that guarantee what he will do in my life. He's given me principles to follow. And as I do, I discover things begin to change. It changes your entire outlook. So he says in verse 18, This shall be written from the generation to come, and the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. 
that phrase is the word to shine. He says, basically he's saying, okay, I know I'm going through all the difficulties, but you know something, when I turn my focus back upon God, I remind myself who he is and his character and what he does and how he loves me and takes care of me and I trust in him, then it changes my whole perspective on life. I'm going to start praising God. I'm going to start shining the light upon him. And telling people, this is the reason why I can stand even in the midst of a shaking mountain, because God is on my side. Because his promises undergird me, his principles guide me. And I know that no matter what happens in my life, I'm going to be all right, I'm going to be safe. Those verses I read earlier, they emphasize the same thing. Cast thy burden upon the Lord. It means to throw it on him, say, here, here it is, I can't do this anymore. I can't handle these things. I'm overwhelmed, they're overtaking my heart. I'm just going to let you take care of it. And he will sustain, that is, he will hold you up and not allow you to be crushed by the things that are around you. He will never suffer you to be moved. Then the other verses talk about how we got to trust. This heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed forever. The word trust there is a word that means to be safe and secure because we found a refuge that cannot be shaken. That's the idea of life. When uh, back in 1984, 88, um, we had a hurricane come by the islands and... Uh, I was suggested not to leave, stay in my house, because uh, we didn't know where it was, didn't know how bad it was going to be, but our house is kind of like in a little valley, and there's a little bump on the edge is a sea. So if, if there's like a 50-foot surge, our house had been basically, we've been living on the roof, okay, to survive, because there had been nothing left but inside. So they said, you probably don't want to stay in your house in case that may happen. Well, they had shelters, but um, I'm not much of a people person, and so I didn't want to go to the shelter either. It was pretty well packed anyway. So I said to my children and my family, we're going to go stay at the church. I mean, what better place to stay than God's church, right? It was further away from the sea. And I remember getting our, we had back then, we had wooden pews with benches with uh, pads on them. I took all the pads off, went into one of the Sunday rooms, filled the, the room with all the pads, and that's where we slept. All five, four, four of us, five of us. Yeah, I think, I think Janelle was born then. Um, all of us were there in the room, packed in there on Monday night when the storm was supposed to hit. And you know something? I felt totally, completely safe. I wasn't concerned at all. In fact, I turned on a radio, Armed Forces Radio, Monday Night Football, and listened to that as we went to sleep. Woke up the next morning, everything's fine. No problems at all. Wasn't even a big deal at all. Didn't happen at all. But I really wasn't concerned, and the reason was because I was in a place that I considered safe, and I knew that the storm would not hurt me. Well, that's what it is for the believer. We are in God. And God's with us. Therefore, no matter what we face in life, we don't need to fear. Because God's going to take care of us. God's going to be with us. God's promises undergird us. God gives us grace and strength every step of the way. And as long as we follow him and trust him and commit it to him, we're going to be okay. Well, know the story of Daniel and Daniel in the den of lions. Remember, Daniel was faithful in God and prayed. And that meant he had to be thrown into the den of lions. And I'm pretty sure back in that culture, they kept the lions fairly starved. So when they threw someone in be basically instant death. And the king, of course, who threw Daniel in, liked him. He was afraid. He didn't sleep all night long because he was afraid what happened to Daniel. Daniel had a very good sleep down there. Um, and he ran to the thing, Daniel, you all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. God kept the lion's mouth shut. And a Sunday school teacher was teaching about this. One of the students says, well, um, how come Daniel wasn't afraid? He said, the teacher said this, because the lion of the tribe of Judah was with him. The lions that were real, they had, didn't have a chance because the real lion was there. And Daniel understood that. Well, guess what, my friends? I don't care what we go through in life, how bad it may seem. The God of all power is with us. The God who is faithful is with us. He will never forsake us and never leave us. He won't necessarily move the storms. He won't necessarily stop the storms from raging around us but he promised to be with us through the storms. He promised to give us the grace to go through the storms in a way that honors and glorifies him. He gives us the promises that we can stand upon that gird us at every moment of the time. He gives us the principles that we can follow every step of the way, and as we do so, we discover and understand the joy of the Lord is our strength, the peace uh, that pass all understanding dominates our hearts. And we look forward to a future that is even greater than our present. And we just go through this stuff, and people are going, how can you handle all these things? What's going on? We can tell them, because... The Lion of the tribe of Judah is with me. The God who's greater than all my problems is on my side, and I'm safe in his hands. No matter what I go through in life, I cannot fail. What a blessing that is. 
even though it seems like everything's collapsing, we still have a happy ending. In fact, every day is a blessed day because we have God in our life. A woman named Lilius Turner Trotter was born in 1853. As she grew older, she discovered she had a great talent to paint. She was an artist. In fact, people recognized her talent and said, you're going to be a great artist. But she was a believer in Christ, and God burdened her heart to go to Africa and to reach people for Christ, which meant she had to give up her artistry, but she really didn't care. She actually went to different uh, agencies to ask for permission to be on their support list to go. Every one of them refused it because she was a single woman and that was not considered safe in Africa. She said, I don't care, God's called me to go. And so she went all by herself to Africa and stayed there for 40 years, reaching people for Christ, doing all that she could to help, particularly girls and women, to accomplish what she could do. And I'm sure that in those years, she had some real difficulties in her life. And as she went through them, she learned to trust upon God and cling to him. And she wrote kind of like a little diary as it would be a story, describing how she was able to face what she faced and stay there faithful all through those years despite what she faced in life. And at one point she said this, Turn full your soul's vision to Jesus and look, look at him. And a strange dimness will come over all that is apart from him and the divine attraction by which God's saints are made, even in this 20th century, will lay hold of you for he is worthy to have all there is to be had in the heart that he had died to win. So what she's saying is that the reason why I was able to do all I was able to do was because I trusted in my God and I kept my focus on him. Years later, a woman named Helen Lemuel read that story, the entire thing, and she was deeply touched by it, inspired by her faithfulness. She lived, Helen lived for 98 years in this earth, and in those years, she wrote several hymns and songs for God. But one of them, written in 1918, came from those words that Lilius wrote years earlier. And what did she write? O oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's a light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Through death and the life everlasting he passed, and we follow him there. Or us sin no more hath dominion, for more than conquerors we are. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world as thine, his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth shall grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And finally, that's basically what the psalmist decided to do. He says, I'm going to stop looking at all these things in my life that just are overwhelming me. And I'm going to turn my attention to God. I'm going to keep my eyes upon him. I'm going to surrender my life to him. I'm going to commit all my life, all my problems, all my difficulties, all my heart, all my feelings to God and say, they're yours and you, you just take care of them for me and be with me. Hold my hand. Give me grace. Give me strength. Let me stand your promises. Practice your principles. Let me step out and live a life that tells people that he's made a difference in me so that when everything else is shaking, I will never be moved because I'm standing on a rock that cannot be moved. And he says, as we look in Jesus, guess what? Everything else begins to disappear and they don't exist anymore. God's going to be with us and we're safe in his hands now and forevermore. My friend, that is a life that is blessed now and forever. We don't have to guess what life is going to be like. We know what life is going to be like. A life of great comfort, strength, and we can face anything in our life, even the worst of times, with joy and hope and peace, because God is with us. He can handle our problems. He will take care of us, take us through the storms, and help us become a greater witness for him than ever before. But we've got to take the step and trust him. Look to him, commit all, and let God work in our life. If we do, we will have that blessed life now and forever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the tough times of life because without them we wouldn't understand and realize how great it is to have you in our life. I know that in the good times of life we take you for granted, but when the tough time comes, we're reminded about how important it is to have God in our life. How important those promises are that we stand upon, 
How important those principles are that lead us and direct us and show us how to live even in the worst of times. To remind us over and over again that we have a God that is more powerful than our problems, a God that power will never ever change, his resources will never run out, a God who's instant, who des- everlastingly really wants to focus upon us, his interest in everything we have to do. He's just waiting there to show us his blessings and pour out his power in our life. Let us come, Father, and trust you. Commit all to you and just let you work in our lives so we can just be the people you need us to be. We're not going to be exempt for all. In fact, I'm asking that you don't make us exempt for problems, but teach us how to trust you in the midst of those problems. And by so doing, help people around us see and realize that there's something different about us because we have a God in our life. We have his promises and principles that change everything. That way we can share with them how they can have the same God in their life and discover what we have discovered, that life with God is a blessed life today and a blessed life forever. And we praise you for it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.